Hello, everybody, and welcome to this We Did It Health broadcast. At We Did It Health, we are working to create a healthy, happy, vegan, and plant based world. We're doing that through building community and offering resources such as today's discussion to help you create relationships where you will plant seeds of hopeful curiosity in others when they ask about a vegan or plant based lifestyle. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel or favorite workshop presentation. We also invite you to join our Facebook community so that you can connect with others and find support and encouragement with like-minded members. And so my name is Mariquita Mariquita Solis, and I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Camilla Paracella to today's program. Welcome, Camilla. Thank you, Mariquita. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for episode number six, the last one of this workshop series about how food is produced and how it affects our health. Today, we will talk about the future of food and what the food industry is doing to feed a growing population with healthy food that doesn't harm, that doesn't hurt animals or harm the planet. So uh, let me share my screen with you. I hope you can see my slideshow. Okay, perfect. <laughs> we did it. So as usual, before we start, let's recap the topics we covered in the previous episode. So in episode one, I shared a little bit about my professional journey as a food engineer and scientist. I explained what food engineering really is, and I discussed how food technology helps us feed the global population. Then in episode number two, we explained why a plant-based diet is a central part of a non-violent, healthy, and sustainable lifestyle. I also gave you precious tips on how to make the most of your food choices, whether you already eat plant-based or not. Then in episode number three about food processing and health, we discussed um, as, as we all know, many people associate uh, processing with something negative uh, when it comes to food, which is factually inaccurate. For example, cooking, drying, and fermentation are all examples of processing methods. And food processing can be used for different purposes, which can be good or bad. So in episode number three, we cleared common misconceptions about both unprocessed and processed foods showing that processing is not the only or even the main factor influencing the health properties of food and beverages. Then in episode four, we explained why food additives are used in food production, whether they are safe or not, how they are regulated and how they can be avoided. In episode Five, I discussed how to interpret food labels, including nutrition facts, expiration dates, and the real meaning of claims such as sugar-free, organic, free-range, and so on. And today, I will give you both the science-based information and real-life ex uh, real examples about the future of food. Now, let me start today's episode by asking you a simple question. How many edible plant species are there? What do you think? I think you'll be surprised to learn that there are approximately 300,000 species of edible plants in the world. What's even more shocking is that we eat less than 0.1% of all edible plants, approximately 200 species globally. And in local supermarkets, you'll find 40 times, give or take. There are different reasons why we grow and eat the plants we do. The first one is the farming characteristics of a plant, including the yield, climate and soil requirements, and weather and pest resistance. Another explaining factor is the natural defenses of a plant, like thorns, thick shells and the chemical substances, toxins, it produces to protect it from grazing herbivores. The mechanisms of insect pollination also play an important role. 
most traditional food crops can be pollinated by different types of insects, while wild plants are frequently pollinated by specific insects found in a certain area. This would make it difficult uh, to grow them on a large agricultural scale. How easy it is to transport and store a food crop is also important because sometimes the cost of bringing fresh produce to, super, to supermarket shelves is too high for the consumer to buy it at a reasonable price. Tradition is obviously another factor. In general, humans are afraid of change. Not all consumers like to try new things. Also, agricultural subsidies and taxes influence of what types of food we produce and eat because they favor certain products. Take the example of fast food that is cheaper uh, than local fruit and veggies in some countries. The final price the consumer pays is frequently artificial due to economic and political interests, meaning that the current food system needs to be more equitable and fair. And finally, another factor is the over-reliance on animal products. Agricultural subsidies, agri-food research funding, food taxing, and labeling legislation are very unequal. They frequently favor animal farming over crop farming. Now, can you believe that three quarters of our calories come from just 12 crops and five animals? The average person centers their diet around meat, dairy, eggs, wheat, sugar, and other commodity crops, which partly explains why we are seeing a pandemic of obesity, heart disease, and cancer. In addition, this agricultural model is extremely inefficient, violent, and unsustainable. So if you want to create a decent world where everyone has access to healthy food, clean water, and fresh air, we need to reform our food system towards plant-centered diets. So let's see more details to understand why. I have presented pretty much the same slide before in episode two, but it's important that we understand what's wrong with our food system before we talk about solutions for the future of food. So please bear with me. So first of all, nearly 1 billion people are food insecure. This means that one out of eight people doesn't have enough food on their table. However, studies show that if the world went vegan, we would be able to feed a further 3.5 billion people in a healthy way, much healthier than now. And that's because animal products are highly resource intensive. We need way more land, water, and agricultural inputs when we grow crops to feed animals and then eat the animals instead of eating the plants directly. Ironically, while 1 billion people are food insecure, most human diseases are due to overeating and unhealthy diets packed with saturated fats, sugar, and cholesterol. Over 75% of North Americans don't eat the minimum recommended intake of fruits and veggies, while the average person consumes twice the protein needed, mostly animal protein. And at the center of this unjust food system, animals are the major victims. They go through horrific physical and emotional suffering so that we eat their body parts and secretions. And in a world that fights for peace and justice, it's contradictory to deliberately hurt sentient beings and on a massive scale. We are talking 80 billion land animals and trillions of aquatic animals every single year. Can you imagine if you were talking about cats or dogs? Now, agricultural subsidies and research funding are largely unequal. They benefit big powerful companies over small producers and animal farming over 
party culture. There is a very interesting book called Meatonomics that explains how the manipulated economics of meat and dairy drive overconsumption. I totally recommend it. And it's not only that, food legislation can be very unfair, both in terms of labeling and tax policies. Let me give you an example. Plant-based milk, for example, it's considered a luxury product in many countries, even though from the production point of view, it's clearly cheaper to produce milk directly from soybeans, for example, than to produce milk through cows that ate the soybeans and converted only a fraction of those into product. And one of the many explaining reasons why plant-based milk is more expensive is the VAT, value added tax. In Germany, for example, VAT is 7% for cow's milk and 19% for plant-based milk, three times higher. Another factor that we need to address in our food system is the working conditions in food production and processing, including low pay, occupational injuries, and excessively long hours. And some of the poor working conditions agricultural workers face are inherent to their occupation. Think of slaughterhouse workers and fishermen, for, for example, who literally spend their days stabbing animals. We cannot ignore their physical and emotional burden. Deforestation is another big problem. We keep clearing land, reaching biodiversity to grow crops and raise animals. A shocking 77% of all agricultural land is used to feed and raise animals for human consumption. Also, we are polluting the planet with plastic, excess manure, fishing gear, chemicals, and carbon emissions. We all know that the mainstream narrative on climate change emphasizes fossil fuels. However, mounting evidence shows that it's impossible not to cross critical tipping points without a global move to plant-rich diets. Of course, we need to change the way we use energy, but also the way we eat. Fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides to increase crop yield are harming the environment and our health. If we didn't waste so much land and other resources to exploit animals, we could be using different farming methods to produce edible crops without the need for so much land and the chemical inputs. For example, hydroponics, vertical farming, and veganic permaculture. Deforestation, pollution, and overfishing are wiping out species, and animal agriculture and fishing together are the leading causes of species extinction. One example, for every one kilogram of fish caught in the oceans, several kilograms of animals deemed with no commercial value are caught by accident and are discarded, frequently injured or dead. And these animals include fish, sharks, turtles, birds who fly near the water surface, sorry, uh, birds who fly near the water surface to catch food and so on. And again, we are not just talking about products, about kilograms of products. We are talking about sentient beings. Bird flu swine flu, SARS, Ebola, and so many other pandemics derived from animal exploitation. Whenever we cram animals into artificial environments or eat their body parts and secretions, chances are zoonotic pathogenic microorganisms will eventually migrate to humans. Also, 80% of the antibiotics sold in the world are used in farmed animals. This is creating superbugs and making people resistant to antibiotics, especially due to drug residues uh, ingested by animal products. Food production emits more carbon emissions than all the cars, airplanes, and trains combined. And animal products emit way more carbon emissions than plant-based foods. 
By going vegan, we reduce our diet carbon footprint by 73%. And finally, we eat too much junk food. Our over-reliance on convenience and our mindless consumption are making us sick. And most junk food and ultra-processed foods contain animal products. Milk, for example, is frequently used as a low-cost filler. That's why you see so many products containing milk or derivatives, even though, even when it doesn't um, seem to make sense that these ingredients are there. And the more we buy junk food, the more companies will produce them. So the transition to a plant-based food system is vital for our quality of life and survival, really. Governments know that, the United Nations and their agencies know that, scientists, farmers, and the agri-food industry, all of them know that. There are, of course, economic, uh, social, political, and human behavior barriers, but slowly and surely we're getting there. We sometimes wonder whether we will be able to change things for the better, but in reality, we are already seeing changes on all levels of the food system, producers, retailers, consumers, and so on. Nowadays, there are plant-based options for almost any traditional animal source product. And this is largely due to advances in food technology, but it's also the combined result of animal rights activism, climate change campaigns, nutrition science advancements, and also social political factors. For example, the COVID-19 pandemic, the war in Ukraine, and the bird flu pandemic, leading to a reduction in the consumption of animal products. But before I talk about food innovation, I want to make it clear that a plant-based diet can be either a diet based primarily on fresh fruit, veggies, whole cereals, beans, etc., or an ultra-processed diet replicating the average Western diet. We've talked about this in the previous episodes, but the average diet based on animal products is far from optimal. It's full of saturated fat, cholesterol, and refined carbs, and also poor in fibers, vitamins, and minerals. Also, the average omnivore eats a huge amount of overly processed food. White bread, salami, ham, bacon, sausages, cheese, chicken nuggets, ice cream, and so forth. That is why many people think that plant-based eating equals replacing animal products with animal-free equivalents on a heavily processed diet, but that's a false assumption. We can mix and match um, whole plant foods with things like supermarket bought old milk and cashew nut cheese in a perfectly balanced and healthy diet. Now, let's finally talk about food technology trends in the plant-based sector. The big question here is how to replicate the sensory properties of animal-based food without using animals. We can do this through optimal formulation, ingredient sourcing, and processing techniques. There is obviously a wide range of animal-free foods, all the way from milk, which is relatively simple to produce, to steaks and other whole muscle meats, which obviously require a lot more effort. I will give specific examples later. And at this point, it's useful to emphasize that cultivated meat, also called lab meat, is not plant-based, okay? It is real meat produced by the cultivation of animal cells in bioreactors. This means you still use animals as cell donors, so it's definitely not vegan. I mean, everything can change in the future. Science evolves every day, and cultivated meat is a novel technology. So maybe in the future, we will find a way not to use animals anymore. For example, growth media that used to come from animals in the past for lab meat production doesn't come from animals 
uh, anymore. Sometimes they do, but not all the time. But the thing is, we still haven't come up with a way not to harvest cells from animals. So again, lab meat is not vegan. Another important aspect is that cultivated meat has nearly the same nutritional properties as meat from slaughtered animals. And this is per se a problem because meat is not healthy as people think. It causes cancer and many other diseases. Science is very clear about that. Now, we can improve the, the sensory, the nutritional profile of plant-based, of lab meat to a certain extent. For example, for reduced cholesterol and reduced saturated fat, but the other nutrition problems persist. The other thing I like to mention is that while lab meat has the potential to greatly reduce animal use, it still reinforces the idea that some species are more deserving of moral consideration than others. Most people wouldn't eat dog meat, let alone human meat, right? But let us focus on plant-based food again. Different plant-based foods have different formulations. And by formulation, I mean all the ingredients and eventual additives in a product. These ingredients must be, of course, animal-free, but it doesn't mean they come only from plants. They may derive from different parts of plants, like stems, leaves, roots, flowers, etc., but also algae, fungi, and these can be either mushrooms or microscopic species. Bacteria, for example, lactic acid bacteria, which are used in traditional fermentation. And finally, recombinant proteins, which are animal proteins made without any animal involvement through a process called precision fermentation. So in this process, you basically insert a gene, a gene sequence in the microorganism's DNA. So it will produce a specific protein from the fermentation of carbohydrates. For example, casein, the main protein from cow's milk can be made via yeast. And not only the source, but also the form of the ingredient matters. Think of soybeans, for example. The degree of milling and extraction produces different ingredients. We can have the whole soybeans, but also the flour, the concentrate, the isolate, and so on. And each of these forms will give different characteristics to the product. For example, if you are making a soy burger, a soy concentrate might be more interesting than soy flour because the finer the powder, the finer the texture, but also the flavor will be less beany, will be more neutral. The product also changes completely if you use fresh ingredients versus dried and milled forms of the same ingredient. So there's really a huge combination of ingredients that we can optimize to reproduce the sensory properties of animal products. You might be familiar with the term alternative proteins. It's used to refer to proteins that don't come from animals. I am not a fan of this term, although I'm guilty of using it because when you say it, everyone knows what you're talking about, but Anyway, I would like to explain why I'm, I'm not an enthusiast of the term alternative proteins. Reason number one, protein is not the almighty nutrient, okay? People are deficient in a lot of nutrients, fibers, antioxidants, vitamins, but not protein, unless you are really malnourished. Second, the term alternative proteins the, the, the word alternative somehow implies the idea that animals are the main sources of proteins and anything else is a lower quality replacement, which is silly because proteins come from plants, literally. Animals are nutrient filters. Plants produce amino acids, not animals. And also natural foods like beans and lentils have been used as protein rich staples for millennia. So referring to beans as alternative proteins can sound really off. And the 
Third reason is that all fractions of ingredients are important for the sensory quality of a food product. Proteins, but also starches, fibers, and fats. It's the right balance between these fractions that will yield a product with the right texture, taste, viscosity, color, etc. And good fats, fibers, pigments, and starches come primarily from plants, not animals. So to sum up the idea, when we talk about alternative proteins or alternative protein foods, we encompass two different things. Naturally sourced animal-free ingredients like legumes, grains, and their products. And cell-cultured ingredients or products. And then within cell cultivation, we have different types of technologies giving rise to varied ingredients and products. For example, we can grow fungi under controlled conditions to produce mycoprotein, which has a similar texture to animal flesh. I already explained what precision fermentation is, but basically you produce a specific compound from microorganisms without using animals. These compounds can be a protein, a pigment, or a certain type of fat that will be added to a product formulation to play an important role. For example, casein is produced by yeast, and then it is added to plant-based cheese to improve the taste and texture. And then cultivated meat and dairy are different from precision fermentation because you are not producing a single compound. You are producing the whole tissue or secretion. And also in cultivated meat, you uh, cultivated meat and dairy, you use animal cells, not microorganisms. So a lot of people confuse these two things, but now you know there are differences. I know that was a lot of theory, even though simplified. So to make it easier, let me give you examples of real products using these ingredients and technologies. I don't like to cite brands and names of products, but in this case, I'll make an exception, but because it's important to get my point across. But please bear in mind that I'm not whatsoever marketing these brands, okay? These are just examples. Like I said, there are tons of plant-based products, so let us focus on plant-based meat to standardize the examples. Beyond Burger, for example, is made exclusively from plant sourced ingredients. You have pea protein as the main ingredient after water, but you also have vegetable oils, carbohydrates, and other compounds that will make the burger taste like animal flesh and have a similar texture. Pea protein is an ingredient frequently used as a thickener, foaming agent, and also emulsifier. And it's also used as a protein-rich ingredient. And pea protein is nothing but the protein fraction of yellow and green peas, which is extracted by physical and chemical methods. And differently from what the name suggests, it's not made only of proteins. It has carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals too. Depending on the method and degree of extraction, we will have different protein concentrations. For example, dried peas contain about 30% protein, but the isolate form can have as high as 90% protein. So like I said, this burger uses only plant sourced ingredients. Now, let me show you another meat alternative, this time using non-animal cell culture, for example, corn products. They are mostly made of mycoprotein, which is produced by a fungus from the Fusarium species by fermentation. Other ingredients, with, um, other ingredients are combined with mycoprotein to give the right texture, flavor, consistency, and so on. For example, potato extract in vegan products and egg white in vegetarian formulations.
Other meat alternatives also use recombinant proteins to make their burgers more realistic, for example, impossible foods. They use a protein from soy called ligimoglobin to give that color and bloody aspect of animal flesh. So the company inserts the DNA for soy ligimoglobin into yeast, grows yeast through fermentation, isolates soy ligimoglobin um, from uh, the microorganisms and adds the compound to the burgers. So this is another use for precision fermentation. Okay, so these examples show there is a lot we can do regarding formulation design. Improved ingredient sourcing is also an important part of the future of food. Underexplored edible plant crops, fungi, algae, precision fermentation ingredients, and even agri-food waste and processing leftovers can provide infinite combinations of taste, texture, color, etc., and also supply essential nutrients. Now, let's see the potential of these food sources. Like we've seen before, we consume a ridiculous fraction of edible plant species. Around 99.9% .9 are simply wasted. However, traditional local crops, forest foods like wild leaves, seeds, nuts, tubers, and fruits, and exotic edible plants can provide varied food year-round. In Brazil, for example, the Agri-Food Research Agency called Embrapa is working to track and list exotic edible plants and educate the public, farmers, and industry on their nutritional, agricultural, and technological potential. They are called PANCS, the acronym for unconventional, unconventional edible plants in Portuguese. In other parts of the world, they are also referred to as UFPs, unconventional food plants, and NCEPs, non-conventional non edible plants. And the list of Brazilian panks includes hundreds of species native to the Brazilian territory. One example is a leaf called Aura pronobis, which has 25% of high quality protein. Now, can you imagine a global list of panks? There's so much unexplored potential. The fungus kingdom also offers a wealth of potential. It includes around 100,000 known species ranging from mushrooms to yeasts. Most of us are familiar with only a dozen types of mushrooms and yeast, the most popular being uh, baker's yeast or Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which has been used for centuries to make uh, beer and bread. But over the last decade, filamentous fungi have been gaining space in the food industry, especially in the alternative protein sector because of their flavor, textural and nutritional properties. And like I said before, yeast is also used in precision fermentation to bypass the animal in the production of proteins and fats. We already established what um, precision fermentation is and what it's used for, but one thing I haven't mentioned is how much faster and more efficient food production is when we use microorganisms instead of animals. Microorganisms have a very fast multiplication rate, while animals typically need months to years to produce food and also require way more resources, water, land, feed, etc. Just for perspective, the typical energy conversion in beef is less than 2%. The rest of the energy ingested from plants is used to form bones, organs, skin, and basically keep the animal alive, moving, breathing, and eating. So using microorganisms is not only more ethical, but also more efficient. And unlike cultivated meat, which is relatively new and 
still in the process of getting regulatory approval in most countries, precision fermentation has been used for decades. It's used to produce insulin, which in the past required the slaughter of pigs. Um, it's also used to produce rennet, the enzyme um, used in cheese making, citric acid, and different flavoring agents. Algae can also be further explored for human nutrition. Humans have eaten algae and microalgae like wakame and nori seaweed for thousands of years. But recently, attention has increased regarding their nutritional and environmental potential. Algae are rich in proteins, essential amino acids, fatty acids, and vitamins like A, D, and E. And two types of microalgae currently dominate the market for human consumption. The first is a group of species called chlorella, and the second is the genus Arthrospora, more commonly known as spirulina. And the important thing here is that microalgae take up less growing space than plants and have from 30 to 60% protein, making it comparable or even superior to soybeans, which have about 35 to 40% protein. And finally, we have agri-food waste and byproducts. Things like overly ripe berries, fruit bagasse, skin and seeds, and leftovers from food processing can be used as valuable sources of biocompounds. These compounds include antioxidants, proteins, lipids, starch, dietary fiber, and cellulose that can be used in different industrial sectors. Please um, watch episode one to learn more about the potential uses of Okara, which is the leftover from soy milk production. So using waste and byproducts is a huge opportunity to minimize malnutrition and environmental pollution, create jobs, and also generate extra income for farmers. So these are all examples of how ingredient sourcing can help us advance a better food system. But of course, we need more research looking into larger scale production and nutrient bioavailability to understand if the nutrients are really absorbed by the human body. Now, let's talk about the processing stage. You can make completely different products from the same ingredients depending on the type of processing, which may include extrusion, fermentation, cooking, drying, and so on. Additional processes can be applied to extend the shelf life of the end product. For example, pasteurization, microwaving, high pressure processing, etc. Additives can also be used to avoid spoilage or to impart certain characteristics to a product, for example, the right level of acidity. And these additives are not necessarily synthetic. Then they can be natural ingredients like vinegar, antioxidants from plants, and pigments from plants. And then the last part is packaging and storage. Let me give you some examples of processing technologies that are common in the plant-based uh, food sector. The first one is extrusion. Extrusion is a traditional process in the food industry where a humid mass is transformed into a product of different shapes and sizes. Extrusion is used, for example, to make pasta. So it's uh, basically a screw system where the mass is pushed through a die by a barrel. And then you have different products depending on the mass composition and the combination of extrusion parameters. For example, heat, mechanical pressure, uh, mechanical energy, uh, moisture, pressure, the size and shape of the openings on the die and so on. 
And then the output can also be can also go through other processes, for example, drying, which uh, happens um, in pasta making, for example. And why is extrusion so important in plant-based foods? Because depending on the process parameters, you can make plant proteins, which are mainly globular, behave like animal proteins, which are mostly fibrillar. So you will have a texture much more similar to that of animal flesh. Three D printing is also gaining space in the plant-based sector. You can make a three D printed whole muscle cut, for example, a steak, using a plant-based dough, or alternatively using cultivated muscle tissue. And the right balance between fibers, fat, moisture, and protein will give that fibrous texture and meaty appearance of a real steak. Scaffolding. Um, it's easy to produce meat alternatives that are restructured. For example, minced meat, nuggets, and sausages, or patties. The real challenge is recreating whole cuts. So not only 3D printing, but plant-based scaffolds can help. You can produce food-grade scaffolds from a range of materials, for example, pea protein isolate or a bacterial nanocellulose. And then you can use scaffolds as support for cell growth in cultivated meat or as a 3D structure for plant-based mixtures. Okay, it's like assembling materials to build a house. It sounds really high tech and it really is. There is a lot of research effort behind this. As we have limited time here, this is just a summary of what we can do in terms of food engineering to recreate animal products um, in a more sustainable and ethical way. Of course, we don't need 3D steaks and high-tech foods to be happy. Nature offers an abundance of healthy foods that don't harm other living beings, grains, legumes, veggies, mushrooms, and so on. But at the same time, it's really nice to have vegan options that are tasty and convenient. Of course, veganism is about justice and empathy and it encompasses much more than our diet. But studies show that the availability of plant-based options do help people become vegan. And as we know, the kickstart, the taking the first step is really important. As I said in the previous episode, food is the powerful form of resistance against manipulation and injustice. Industries don't like intelligent, compassionate and healthy people because those people are not profitable, okay? Industries target apathetic consumers who just, who simply consume and don't ask questions. Um, don't be that person. <laughs> and what can we do as individuals and consumers to accelerate the transition to a better food system that benefits everyone? So first of all, those of us who have the privilege to eat every day and choose our meals should ideally stop consuming animal foods, which are products of violence and oppression. That's the first and most important step. Other than that, whenever possible, support local producers, fair trade, handmade food, and also organic food. Eating seasonal fruits and veggies is also a great idea. And if you can, avoid eating in places that use veganism as a marketing tool uh, while they keep exploiting animals and people. I'm not going to cite names, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you can also favor natural foods, natural whole foods like grains, beans, fruits, nuts, and veggies. Also, whenever possible, you can choose vegan companies over big powerful brands that launch vegan products, but don't really intend to phase out animal products. They're most probably just looking for new customers. 
You can also eat less of the top crops, especially wheat, rice, and corn, and instead look for alternatives like amaranth and millet, which have a great nutritional value, are resilient to droughts and can grow in poor soils. And by doing that, uh, we contribute to a more resilient food supply and more choices for farmers. So these are all suggestions that I hope you can apply um, considering your reality. Now, I would like to invite all of you who follow a plant-based diet to take this online survey on eating habits and motivations. We will leave the link here in the chat and later in the description of the video on YouTube. This is part of a study I'm conducting with other researchers to map drivers of behavior change when it comes to food and animal rights. The survey takes only five to 10 minutes and the results will be used to develop strategies to accelerate animal liberation and adjust food system. And your uh, participation is greatly appreciated. This is our last workshop, so I wanted to leave you a key message. Always remember that we are all drivers of societal change. All justice movements in the history of humankind started with a small group of people fighting for what's right. So never take your power for granted. It's also important to understand that consumer choices do make a difference towards justice. It's supply and demand. But we still need ethical vegans uh, pushing for social change by educating uh, people on animal rights and planting seeds. So food technology and animal rights should really unite to promote positive change um, and faster. Like I always say, the future is vegan or there is really no future, at least not a decent one. I also invite you to read my latest book, Food for Thought, whether you are vegan or not, uh, because the more we educate ourselves, uh, the, more, the more we live mindfully and uh, positively and also get to inspire um, other people, especially in terms of animal rights advocacy. It's really important to know what we're talking about. So this is a labor of love and dedication. So, Please check it out if you can. Now, um, yeah, thank you all for listening. Um, it's been a real pleasure to be here over these six episodes and I hope you learned positive things. Uh, you can find more details about my work at camilaperucelo.com and also Google Scholar. And if you're watching this video on YouTube, please make sure you like the video and share it with your family and friends so this message reaches more people and saves more lives. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Camilla. Um, it looks like we have a question. Let's see. Right. Um, some from Fernando, in your opinion, what can we do to effectively abolish animal abuse? Yeah, I like the way he wrote abuse and use because really animal use is animal abuse. Um, yeah, there are actually a number of things we can do to abolish animal exploitation. Um, and of course, this begins with um, changing the property legal status of animals, because that's what allows um, us to use animals as if they were things. They are not individuals, according to legislation, they are property. So, um, for example, um, we all know, many, many of us know that um, we don't actually need um, a collective awakening to change, to change things. This will never happen. Uh, we need, like I said before, a small group of people fighting for justice um, to push for social change and 
uh, social studies show that we need 3.5% of the population fighting for something for this thing to happen. So we need to reach this tipping point of awareness. We only have 1% of vegans in the world. So uh, we need to increase this number somehow. And how can we do this? By um, uh, combining, um, of course, grassroots animal rights activism with uh, pragmatic approaches, for example, food technology, producing foods that mimic animal products uh, to help people transition away from animal foods. Uh, this is the main thing. Of course, like I said before, veganism is not about, it's not only about what we eat. It's about justice in general. It's about compassion. It's about treating other beings with respect. Uh, but of course, food is the main use of animals. So that's why it's so, that's why it's so many vegans, that's why we ethical vegans focus so much on food. Um, so other pragmatic approaches will be, for example, nudging techniques. You know, for example, um, you know how hard it is for us ethical vegans to uh, order vegan food in airplanes, for example. Um, so the default option should be vegan because vegan food is inclusive. Everyone can eat plant-based, almost everyone, okay? Some people are allergic to nuts and, and, and soy, for example, but in general, plant-based food is much more inclusive than omnivore food. So why not make it um, the default option? Okay? And how can we do this? Of course, airline companies don't care about uh, animal ethics, but they do care about money and they do care about um, things like, um, what's the, the word called? Their reputation. Um, so if you sell them the idea, for example, look, you will reduce your carbon footprint by X percent um, by going plant-based, this is good marketing for them, right? And it also helps animals and it helps the cause. It helps normalize plant-based food. So there are really, there is really a combination of things we can do to, to achieve um, animal liberation. And I hope it happens fast. <laughs> I hope this helps, I, ho I, I hope this answers your question. That was a great answer. Yeah, it really made me think. I mean, the power is in our hands. You're right. And the, the fact that when you talk about the animals not not being considered individuals, that's a huge part of it that I haven't thought about in a long time. Yeah, yeah, it's really sad. So yeah, that's why, for example, animal focusing on animal welfare and single single issue campaigns like banning uh, crates, banning debicking practices. Um, this is not the right way to go because it normalizes violence. It, it it sends the idea that there is a right way to use other sentient beings, and there isn't. There isn't a right way to use and kill other beings. And. Yeah. Any more questions <laughs> or comments? I'm going to have to go rewatch it again. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> to really. Yeah, I, I hope it was not overwhelming. If no. I know it, it was a lot of theory, but I tried to simplify things and also by giving real life examples, I think it's easier to understand. Yeah, no, it made a lot of sense. So, um, but yeah, it's a lot. I mean, it was it wasn't too much, but it was a lot of great information. So definitely oh, want to watch it again. See what else I can, you. you know, what I miss. So yeah, and this was yeah. this has been a wonderful series. Okay, so we have one more question. 
it is far more broadcast, the new technology is usually from tech startups. How do you think we can balance with also keeping farmers involved? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, that's actually one of the many reasons why I'm not, I'm not a fan of lab meat or cultivated meat. Okay, because, for example, it's much easier to run programs to help farmers transition away from animal farming towards crop farming. Then, for example, how can we, you know, in terms of livelihoods, lab meat is not inclusive. It's, it's a high tech thing. It's completely different from the know-how, from, from the knowledge and work experience farmers have. So it's much more intelligent and inclusive to invest in plant crops, like I said before, instead of you know, going for lab meat. Also, there are many other problems with lab meat. Like, I don't want to demonize it. I know it's um, one among many solutions Okay, because it, it's so difficult to to change um, the behavior behaviors that are so ingrained. Um, for example, eating animal products. Um, so um, things like okay, if if you have to choose between someone eating um, a real animal versus someone eating lab meat. Of course, the second option is preferable because less animals were harmed. But at the same time, there is the this problem with farmers' livelihoods. There is also the problem with nutrition. Animal flesh is not healthy, as I said before. There is also the problem regarding the investment, the money you need to implement um, lead meat cultivation facilities. It's very, very expensive. So it's kind of frustrating to see so many resources going into lab meat while you can work with, like I said, exotic plants, um, agri-food waste and byproducts, algae, fungi. There are so many solutions. Why focus on something that is a niche market? I don't think this, I don't think lab meat will ever penetrate 100% of the market. Okay, this is just a personal opinion. Okay, but uh, and also we are talking about one single type of product, which is meat. There are thousands of types of animal use. So yeah, I think the, the answering the question again, the best way to keep farmers involved is helping them transition transition away from animal farming to crop farming. And that's what the Rowdy Girl Sanctuary is doing. It's yeah, fun. exactly. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, there are many pro programs worldwide doing this. Okay, everyone, I think that's all. If you don't have any more questions, thank you so much for your patience, especially in the beginning with the tech problems we had. <laughs> Thank you Thank everyone. You. And Marikita, I will miss you. I know, and I miss all of y'all. Well, I'm sure that we'll, you'll be here again with another series. Well, we'll talk about that and we'll get you back on yeah. here. The series has Absolutely. been wonderful. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you, bye, all the best, bye. Bye, namaste vegan. <laughs>